Well, amen and good morning and hello and thank you that there's people out there. Thank you for coming to church this morning. Goodness me, am I so glad to see to see people and to be back together at, at church. It's been like three months. Christmas Day was the last time that we gathered together as a congregation. And I know that there's a lot that I miss, but you're reminded of what you really miss when you're back together, like singing with people and hearing people behind you sing. So thank you, Dave. Also, by the way, Dave's first time uh, leading as worship pastor in person. So kind of first day on the job with in person. <laughs> I miss that so much, just being able to sing together. Uh, so that's super great to do that this morning. But also just to all of you gathered here this morning, so grateful to have people to preach to or to have a distance between myself and the camera. Uh, so welcome to you at home as well, all of you guys watching at home. We haven't forgotten about you. We're so glad that you're still gathered around to participate in church this morning. But usually in the studio, the camera and I are like separated by like social distancing you know, measures. And there's a couple of guys in the studio. And I've got to tell you this for you here, just to kind of prep you a little bit. The studio crew are notoriously a tough crowd to preach to. Let me just say that. You're like, yeah, they don't do that, like laugh at all. Like I got so, so self-conscious, like, you know. So it's so great to have people here to be able to preach to and to respond to in, so, in some ways. So thank you for gathering on this historic moment as we reopen, re-reopen church again. Let's hope that we can make it at least through Easter. Amen. And beyond. Because as you saw in the announcements, we have a ton lined up for our Easter. In a way, I think it's like, maybe for me personally, we're overcompensating for not being able to do Easter last year. So now this year we're doing double everything. Just like, pull, yeah, pitch your tent outside, just pull in for the week and camp out. We're going to have an amazing Easter time in a couple of weeks. So just speaking of that, let me just, before I get started this morning, uh, just give you a little bit of a heads up, church, on kind of where we're heading, sermon series, preaching in the next couple of weeks. So building up to Easter, uh, the next two weeks, Pastor Justin will be preparing us for Easter we have our Easter week. Then after Easter, we're going to change gears or change focus slightly preaching-wise. So we just finished quite a, a comprehensive topical series, Rule of Life. After Easter, we will be tackling First Timothy as a book. So taking 12 weeks to preach through First Timothy. So that's two weeks per chapter. Lots of culturally relevant issues, lots of relevant issues for our church. So really looking forward to journeying quite slowly through a New Testament book together. So that's happening uh, after Easter. But in this week, let me say as well, exciting. So we've got AGM coming this week. You would have seen that. And so by now, maybe you know that what I like to do the Sunday before AGM or church general meetings is to talk a little bit about church. And in many ways, what I'm going to do this morning is kind of part one, part two will be at the AGM. So we're really going to set us up for what we're going to talk about at the AGM. So you would have heard Candace mention this. So AGM is like, has this connotation of business meeting. And to be sure, there's business elements we've got to take care of in the meeting. But that's minor, especially for this meeting. Mainly what you're going to be doing this coming AGM, two things. One, looking back over 2020, which was a crazy year for us as a church. Uh, and one of the unique things is church was online last year, so we've got footage of everything that happened in church. And so I don't want to give too much away, but to say we're going to have a moment to just reflect on all that happened last year and celebrate what God does as a church, because it was amazing what He did. Amen? So we're going to look back, and then also what we're going to do, AGM, is spend a lot of time looking forward to the particular purposes that we as leadership believe uh, God has for us, the particular direction that He's taking us. So that's coming, and I want to tee that up today. So very much today, after this morning, you'll hopefully know enough about what we're going to be doing this next year or years to come, and on Wednesday, find out how we're going to do that. So without further ado, turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. Um, this is also something I don't get to do in studio. You don't get to see people turn into their Bibles and hear pages rustling because... The studio crew just didn't read their Bibles. Just kidding. Love our studio crew. So grateful for the guys who have kept church online. And just by the way, for you gathered here, for the guys at home, very first time we're doing hybrid, a very different way of doing church service together. And just want to praise and thank all of our tech volunteers and our brand new services director, Candice, up in the control room as well, doing a fantastic job today. So you're in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 is where we're going to be camped out. A few verses there for the rest of this morning. 
if you've been a Christian for some time, if you've kind of studied the New Testament, if you've been a Christian for a while, I would say, and had a close look at these New Testament letters, you might be surprised that kind of on a day where I want to talk about church and hopefully motivate us as a church, it would be surprising to choose 2 Corinthians, first of all, because if you've read Paul's letters, 2 Corinthians, without doubt, is, is, one, is the one that gives a window into his personal struggles as a pastor, church planter, his issues with this church at Corinth. Right, he had planted this work there in Corinth, had spent two years establishing it. Uh, it had started really well, but he went away um, and started to work in Ephesus, and there were some issues there which he had to address. So he, he wrote the, the letter first, Corinthians. In fact, he mentions other letters that we don't have. At least four letters Paul wrote to the church at Corinth dealing with particular issues. Like it was, it was kind of, it was in a lot of trouble. And, and eventually even there were the kind of these guys coming in from the outside, these sort of itinerant preachers who weren't really gospel preachers. They were kind of turning people away from the gospel, but they were very charismatic speakers. Uh, so they looked good, they spoke really well, and they were turning this church that he had planted away from him, kind of publicly discrediting him. I mean, they were mocking everything from his speaking ability to his looks. And Paul even acknowledges that. He, I mean, we don't know what he looked like, but he describes himself, uh, his personal appearance as dwarfish. So, I mean, they were mocking him, discrediting his work. And so he finds himself now in 2 Corinthians defending himself and defending this work. He's planted his spent two years, he's gone there and come back, gone there and come back, he's sent Timothy, he's written these letters. I mean, it's just a painful work, and now he's just kind of venting. And especially in chapter 10 through 13, so where are we going to be today, chapter 10, if you read 2 Corinthians? So it's very personal, the whole letter, but in chapter 10, man, he's just wide open about his feelings, about all that he's going through, you know, so you may be surprised. No one generally turns to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 when we're trying to motivate talking about church because he has Paul bearing his soul about his anguish for this church. Now, rest assured, that's not the angle that I'm taking. I'm not in anguish. I've loved my first year here. But when he does this, when he's opening up about his particular calling to Corinth, Paul gives us some detail on his particular purpose and what he believes is his purpose for this church at Corinth. That's why we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. All right, makes sense? Already, let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and reading from verses 12 to 18, right in the middle where he's talking about these other guys who are destroying his works. This is what he says. We, Paul, me and his crew, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves, these other guys. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. In fact, the real wording there is a lot stronger. They are not wise. We, however, will not boast, will not boast beyond proper limits. We will confine our boasting to the spirit fear of service God himself has assigned to us, a sphere that also includes you. We're not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you, for we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. He's saying, we reach you, you heard of the gospel from us. Neither do we go beyond our limits of our boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast about the work already done in someone else's territory, but let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. For it's not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commands. So in the middle of this defense against these guys, Paul says something really specific about the particular ministry that he has and the particular 
purpose that God has for that work in Corinth. What I want to run through this morning, let's give you the outline up front, all those eight type people who love the outline, and run through five things. I'm going to really just build one argument. I'm going to talk about we have been given an assignment as a church. And we'll talk individually. We have been given an assignment. The assignment is within the general sphere of God's calling in our lives. This assignment has a territorial focus. The assignment is comprehensive and our assignment is not restrictive. So here we go, number one. We have been given as a church an assignment. And where this comes from, a few years ago, one of, one of my mentors uh, in, in church, an older pastor, we were just meeting regularly, and he kind of asked me just out of the blue, he said, like, hey, man, Richard, like, like, how are you doing with the assignment God has given you? I was like, what do you mean? Like, I finished studying. I've done my assignments. I'm, thankfully, I'm done. And he said, no, 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 like, like, well, like, what is going on with the particular tasks that God has given you at this particular time? And I've never heard that phrase before and, and wondered about it. And in a large way, what I'm talking about this morning is just this one big idea that we individually will get there, but for now, we as a church, Rosebank Union Church, our church, has a particular assignment. And it comes up here in this passage have a look at verse 13 again, and I want to read to you from scholar George Guthrie, he's a New Testament scholar, he wrote what I think is the best commentary on 2 Corinthians, and he translates this verse this way. He says, we on the other hand refuse to boast beyond proper limits, but boast within the boundaries of the assignment God has given us, boundaries that reach so far as to you. So the boundaries of the assignment God has given us, is what he's talking about. And that's a, it's a curious phrase. And if you've got different translations out here, you'll read different ways. So, for example, the one that we read earlier in our V says, the sphere of service God assigned to us. Other ones will say, the area of influence God assigned to us. Let's think about that as a church, as language. Another one says, the limits of the work to which God has appointed pointed us. It's very particular language. I think you get the idea there of what Paul is talking about here. The apostle Paul has it very clear in his mind that God has assigned to him the particular task of planting a gospel ministry, a church in that particular city of Corinth. In other words, Paul's going to the city of Corinth was not just an impulse. It wasn't just coincidence that he ended up there. It wasn't even just kind of a strategic plan. Well, that's an important city. It would be great for us to go there. We know that Paul had done that with other areas and God had closed the door. No, no, His view, Paul was very clear that in his mind, God had assigned to him the particular task of establishing a church in that particular city of Corinth. And I've got to say, I really like this word assignment. That as a church, you've been given a particular assignment. I know when I bounced it with our ministry team a long, long time ago, last year, we started talking about these things, and there was some skepticism because assignment sounds too much like, you know, like homework. You're like, oh, man, I've got to go do this. I mean, there's something you're going to get marked on. It's pass or fail. It's drudgery. But what Paul has in mind here is simply the idea within the general sphere of God's calling for him, there was a particular task that God had appointed to him particularly. And he had a particular territorial focus, Corinth. That's point number two. Our assignment as a church uh, is within the sphere of our, general sphere of our, of our calling. So this task, Corinth, we know that Paul, 
His, the general sphere of his calling was to be apostle to the Gentiles. Contrast Paul with Peter, who we know the apostle Peter, the general sphere of Peter's calling was to be apostle to the Jews. And we see this in Galatians 2 verse 7. It says, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. So by the way, entrusted with the gospel is similar language of a sign to, so he has this idea, basically Paul is saying that his general commission was to be the apostle to the Gentiles, Peter's general commission, apostle to the Jews, to establish a gospel ministry where it had not been known. That was his general commission, but his current assignment was to do that in the city of Corinth. Does that make sense? General commission, current assignment. Current assignment has a particular territorial focus. That's point number three. You cannot miss in this passage the very clear geographical markers that he's using. He's talking literally about territory, about geography, and he believes God, the assignment is the city of Corinth. So these translations use the words fear of influence and the limits of God's work, but it's actually a very common word describing city limits. So archaeologists, archaeologists since then have like dug up stuff and found these inscriptions from Galatia of that time period where a particular governor of Galatia, a man named Sotidius, had issued this edict that every one of the citizens of Galatia are ordered to provide transport for government officials. Can you imagine? But the limits of that edict was it was within the city limits of Galatia. It's the exact same word that Paul's using here, a very specific territorial boundary to the assignment that God had given him. So his focus is on the city of Corinth, and Paul's not going to move on until he believes he has finished the assignment he's been given in Corinth. You still with me? We've been given a particular assignment. It's a specific task delegated within the general sphere of how God has called, it, it called us. It has a territorial focus, number four. The assignment is comprehensive. And here's what I mean by that. I think this is really important. It's quite stunning in this passage. It has a lot of practical implications for us. So let's have a look again at the middle of verse 15 to middle of verse 16. Paul says this, our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will be greatly expanded, and I hear this, so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. So the attitude that the Apostle Paul has here as church planter, as pastor of this church, who's now going through immense struggles, his attitude is stunning. But think about it like this. Think, think about if you have been given a project. Maybe that's another word for assignment, project. Think about you've been given a project at work, let's say. And you've been working on this project for two years. It's the length of time Paul had spent in Corinth. You've been working on this project for two years. From the beginning, it had been a tough project. Man, there were problems, but you worked and you worked. And then eventually, you know, you got other people in from the outside to help as Paul recruited Timothy and other people. And as he went away, he sent all these letters. So it had started with difficulty. It had been fraught with problems all the way through. Now it's two years later, now you've got news of this latest devastating news of how you're being discredited and all the work that you've done is like useless. What, what do you do? Let's think about you and work your projects. Two years now. I mean, I'm going to bet it's like one of two options crossing your mind. One, man, it's just time. Let's just shut this thing down. Just mothball the project. We've invested so much energy. We've invested so many resources. Sound familiar? I mean, it, you would want to do this. You'd be like, yeah, we're, we're done. It's clearly not going to work. Shut it down. And let's move on to the next opportunity. Let's invest our resources somewhere else. 
That's what you would reasonably do. Or you might say, well, we're not going to shut it down, but hey, you know what we'll do is we'll just kind of drip feed it some resources. We'll just keep it, we'll sideline it. We'll just keep it running on the side, just keep the people happy, but our focus is really going to be on the next thing because this is clearly not working. Do you know what I mean? This is literally Paul's situation with this church. But what he says here stunningly is he is expressing a commitment to make this work. He wants to genuinely see their faith increase. In fact, Paul believes that his ability to move on to the next task is dependent on him first finishing this, seeing it come to fruition, seeing it flourish. He cannot move on. He says, I want to see your faith grow, that our sphere of activity is, is expanded among you so that we can move on to the next region. We're not going to move on to the next region. We can't move on to the next region until we see this work which is stunning if you think about it in your own life and if you think about it in church life. So another New Testament commentator, Frank um, Gabelin, puts it like this. He says, the principle being illustrated here, and it's a, it's a beautiful general principle, I think. He says, the principle illustrated here is this. A task undertaken at the direction of God or in fulfillment of a divine commission should not be left unfulfilled simply for the sake of grasping new opportunities. This next line is so stunning. Consolidation precedes advance. The call to begin is the call to complete. And you've got to see what a huge temptation it would have been for the Apostle Paul to have just pulled away from Corinth. He was busy at that time in Ephesus. And if you read of Paul's ministry, Ephesus was like this revival. In Ephesus, it was amazing what was happening in Ephesus. It would have been so easy for him to go, I'm going to focus on what's clearly happening here. And there was a grasping of the new opportunities, but he's determined consolidation precedes advance. We are not shifting our focus until we believe that we have established the ministry, we've done the assignment that God has called us to. It would have been so easy for him to go, we've won a few converts, we did a good thing. But his assignment was not to win converts, it was to build a gospel ministry to saturate that city with the gospel. And he does not feel like it was done yet. All right, number five. So the assignment, it's territorial, it's comprehensive. And number five, the assignment is not restrictive. And I think it's important to add this because what we're saying is that there's this huge focus on Corinth. But it does not mean that Paul's mind was exclusively on Corinth. What I mean is the ultimate purpose Every person and Paul and us today is to make disciples of all nations. And just because Paul's focus was on Corinth does not mean that the ends of the earth was not on his radar. Because he still says, we desire so we can preach the gospel in regions beyond you. We know Paul's mind was actually on Rome. He really wanted to get to Rome. He spoke about that a couple of times and he would make it to Rome. So he's still thinking ends of the earth. He's not restricted to only Corinth, that he's there and he's there forever and he's never going to move on from there because the scope of the mission is always worldwide, but the focus at a particular time, the assignment, this time is this place. That's a summary of these few verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, let's first apply this to us as a church and then we'll talk individually for a moment because if you've been around Rosebank for a little while, at least since September last year, I think you know where I'm going with this because we've spoken about it a few times already. We believe we have been given an assignment, Rosebank Union Church. We have a particular assignment. That particular assignment falls within our commission to make disciples. But within that commission, we have been assigned to 
and territory. See, that's what's just stunning about this passage, the passion, the focus on that region, the boundary limits. We have been given an assignment. The assignment is we've been assigned to a territory. That territory is Joburg. Assignment, Joburg. There's a reason God has us here at this place, in this corner of this crazy intersection in the middle of Joburg, there's a reason he's established this ministry for over 115 years that he's given us the resources that we have. We have an assignment within our great commission to make disciples. We have a particular focus for the city of Joburg, and it's a comprehensive assignment. Is there anybody out there who would say, well, maybe we're done with Joburg? Joburg's good, right? I mean... Nobody's going to say that. Not yet. The job's not finished. In Joburg, Rosebank's been here 115 years. There's been other incredible churches in Joburg. There are incredible churches in Joburg. But the job's not done. Can we say that we can see in Joburg a biblical Christianity taking root? Can we say that? No, the job's not done. And until we believe as a church that there's been some sense of release from God that this phase or this assignment is over, we have to maintain our focus for establishing a real gospel, Jesus-centered presence in Joburg. But that does not mean, point five, that we only ever think about Joburg. It doesn't mean we defund our missions department I mean, absolutely, we keep that going. But we also realize this. This is the important one. We realize that actually our ability to effectively reach the ends of the earth depends on us being effective in Joburg. That's what Paul was saying to Corinth. Do you see that? Our, our, our scope as a church is the ends of the earth to make disciples of all nations, but our particular assignment at this time is to recover focus of the city of Joburg. Make sense? That's the what. From Wednesday, we'll find out a little bit more about the how. But before I close today, I want to spend a little bit of time, a few minutes left, applying this personally. So we're stepping away from corporate and Rosebank and church to talk personally. Why? Well, because you're here and I love seeing people again, but also because Paul actually does this. In this passage, he starts to talk to them individually, well, in the whole book. But in this particular passage, he talks about their faith. He's kind of saying, like, it's dependent on you individually. So we've got to talk about individual focus here. And all I want to do is simply this, those same five points. I want to just, just change the personal pronoun there. And talk about that individually, because I think these same things apply to us individually. You have an assignment. And I have one. We do, individually. A particular assignment. Like that mentor said to me, I would say the same thing to you. You, we, have been given an assignment. That assignment is for here and for now. It's within the general sphere of how God has called you, how he's wired you, how he's made you, the experiences that he's given you. He generally uses you in this way, but he's got a particular assignment for you here and now. That assignment is attached to where you are now, time and place. It's comprehensive, but it's not restrictive. Let me walk through those with you personally. I'm actually only going to do three of them for time's sake. Number one, two, and four. So first, you have individually been given an assignment. And I want you to, I want you to hear the language as I heard it that day, a particular task at a particular time. This actually should not be a surprise to you as Christians. Maybe we haven't used the word assignment but we've seen it in texts like Ephesians 2 verse 10, which says, for we are God's handiwork, his personal creation. His poem is the word there. He's created us a particular way. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to generally do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
Again, do you see this idea generally being prepared with this kind of ultimate purpose, with this generally the way he's wired you physically, your abilities, emotionally, your personality, he's given you that and your experiences for this general sphere of how he's going to use you, like he uses me now as a pastor, and always but now as a pastor, but for you, maybe as a mom or a dad or a teacher or a lawyer or your workplace ministry, that's the place God has put you as the general sphere. He's going to use you to establish something in your workplace or even by vocationally, you're going to work, but on the side, you're going to be able to give time to nonprofit or religious activity, but whatever the general sphere of your calling is, he's wired you that way. And I think you kind of know this. You've heard about this in Christianity. There's a reason you're here. The ultimate purpose make disciples. But within that, the general sphere, so Psalm 139 is this famous psalm about in my mother's womb, you wove me together. It says, you saw my unformed substance. You brought my frame into existence as this idea of frame is your, my physicality, my physical ability, the unformed substance, my emotions, the fact that I'm introverted or left brain, right brain, all of those things. But then it says, and the days ordained for me are written in your book forever. It's like he's created you in this way. But then with these particular tasks that God prepared in advance, you've been given an assignment. That assignment is within the sphere of your calling. Number three, which is number four in the outline, if you're following it, that I want to get to, is that your assignment is comprehensive. I want to spend a little bit of time. We've just got a few minutes left. So much more I want to say, but I want to camp out here because this, this part's nuanced. It's not as simple as it seems, but I feel like it might be really important. Your assignment is comprehensive. You see, this, it's this idea of Paul's determined, his perseverance, his laser-like focus. I'm going to finish the job at Corinth, and even though it's really difficult, I'm not just going to take the next easy opportunity that comes away. I'm going to finish what God has assigned me to. And I want to say that the same with us, with your assignment. Don't give up if the job's not done, is what I want to say. And I'm going to say that. Don't give up if the job's not done. Often at times of transition, what often moves us away is when things are difficult. And you've got you to see often a, a sign that things are difficult is not a sign that you're meant to move on. In fact, often case in ministry, in ministry it's the opposite. It would be kind of easy for us as a church, you know, again, thinking of Joburg. Now, man, Joburg's tough. It's a play. We did our best, 114 years, man. There's other exciting opportunities. Let's go do this, this, or this. Or in the personal sphere of what God is calling you to do and tasks, because it's difficult isn't an indicator that it's time to move on. In ministry, it's often the opposite. Now, that's not to say, that's why this is nuanced. That's not to say God never moves you on. Because remember point five. He is, it's, it's not restrictive. I believe he means to move people around and move from assignment to assignment. Things change. But there's gotta be this sense of I've completed the task. I'm not just running away from the problems. But there's a sense of being released. There's a sense of hearing from God. Your assignment has been completed. Check. Well done. You passed. I shouldn't use that language because that's so negative. That's, that's not what it's like at all. But you know what I mean? This idea of being given this task, just because it's hard, is not a sign to be moving on to the next easy thing. That's exactly the opposite of what Paul's doing. But there will come a time for you to move to the next assignment within the general sphere of God's calling for you. I mean, as I think about this, that's, I mean, Master, I'm here a, a year now, but it was a year ago that I left another sort of ministry, and it was only with that deep sense of that assignment had been completed. It could have left earlier when things were difficult, but didn't, because it felt like we had to, you know, see out. Didn't know this then, but this is giving vocabulary now to the sense 
persevering with the particular assignment and task that God has given you for here, for now you will know when he's releasing you from that assignment to the next assignment within the general sphere of his calling for you. I felt like that needed to be said. Church, let's pray together. Because we realize as a church, yeah, there's a task, an assignment, job's not done, a lot of work to do. But also you're here, you're here today, thank you, and you guys online, still joining us online or listening to this message whenever you are. If you're with us, it means God has you here this time for a reason, the sphere of your general calling, the sphere of the church's general, they're overlapping, and we're excited to see what God does in your life, individually and in ours as a church. Amen? Let's pray for that. God, we come before you and just so much on the table and our hearts this morning, this beautiful passage of this task, this assignment you gave in these difficult circumstances. And Lord, how you sustained that ministry then and how that gospel did extend out of Corinth right to where we are today. We praise and thank you, God. And we ask that you would give us as a church that same perseverance, endurance, strength, laser-like focus, determination to see biblical Christianity take root in Joburg and therefore and then beyond. Help us, it's your church, Lord Jesus. And guide us, we pray, and we come to you individually as moms, dads, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, members of households, colleagues, members of businesses, of community, and God, we I pray this morning, Holy Spirit, we gathered here in this place, but for everybody gathered in their, in their homes, would you move individually in people's hearts, help them to see the particular assignments you've given them at this particular time. And for those discerning transition, would you grant them great clarity by knowing when the work is done and what the next assignment is. And lastly, we praise and thank you, Jesus, that you, that we even get to talk about this ultimate purpose in our lives, sphere of your calling and these particular assignments. We thank you, Jesus, that you choose to use us. You called us for these noble tasks, and ultimately you suffered and died to enable us to accomplish this, to enable us to be all that you created us to be, which is holy and righteous and to be filled with good works. We had no shot of doing any of this. We had no shot of being picked, of being used apart from your grace demonstrated on the cross. And we thank you for that. The dignity of being called, of being part of moving your kingdom forward. And we just reflect on the price that was paid for your church, the members of your church. Help us to steward that gift well. To not just move on to the next easy thing when times are tough as a church and as individuals in our families. We pray for those in tough times in their marriages and families. We're tempted to move on. For those in tough times in other relationships or at work and tempted to move on with nowhere to go. God, we just come before you and pray, Holy Spirit, for your direct leading and intervention by your grace. And in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Rosebank Union Church. If you've enjoyed this message, please feel free to share it with others. And if you would like to support the work of Rosebank Union Church, please visit the giving link on our website at ruc.org.za.